Hi, everyone. If you're just joining, my name is Jody Cohen, and I'm a reporter for ProPublica. My name is Jennifer Smith Richards, and I'm a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and we will be your host today. Welcome to today's session, Ticketed on Campus, How to Investigate Police Ticketing of Students at Your School. As an additional note, this session is being recorded and a link to the captioned video will be emailed to everyone who registered. A transcript will be available upon request. For those who are new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. And today's program is in partnership with the Chicago Tribune and the Journalism Education Association. Today, we're gonna to be taking a closer look at our reporting where we found that Illinois public schools have been working with police to ticket students for misbehavior at school, resulting in municipal fines as high as $750. Now in this special event for student journalists, we'll talk about the public documents that can reveal what's happening inside schools and the best journalistic practices for pursuing this subject thoroughly and fairly. You'll also hear firsthand from a Chicago area high school that used the investigation's findings to conduct reporting on its own campus. So we're going to focus today on Illinois, but this practice does exist in other states. Uh, so when you report this out in your own community, you may find differences in the way that tickets are issued, um, the reasons and even the consequences to students who are ticketed. I'm going to share some slides now. Okay. So if you're reporting on this in Illinois, a good starting point is this database that we built as we reported on this issue. Um, there, you'll learn how whether we looked into your school or your district and what we found. So although we did not look at every single high school in the state of Illinois, we did look at schools that represented about 80% of the state's high school enrollment, which ended up being a lot of schools. When we did not examine a school, you'll still find some basic information about how police are involved in student incidents that happen at school. And that, that is data that we pulled from a federal data source called the Civil Rights Data Collection. Um, that information is very limited. It will tell you how often police got involved at school, and how often students were arrested at the school, but it does not specifically track ticketing by police. That's sort of where our job came in and uh, was, was so different than what was already provided um, in federal sources. And it's your opportunity now to tell students and families within your school uh, the role that ticketing is playing and you know, keep our reporting going. Sorry about that. We're going to uh, go ahead and tell you how we started out reporting on police ticketing at school. We really started with this broad question, what happens when police get involved in discipline at school? We know that there are more police in school than ever before, and this was a question that we had. So we learned that one way police participate is by writing students tickets for their misbehavior. The tickets are for violating local ordinances or local laws, Usually things like vaping, if you're a minor, fighting, disorderly conduct, or cannabis possession. But we needed to know more. How often was ticketing happening? For what reasons? Who was getting ticketed? And what happens to students who get these tickets? Now, we answered a lot of these initial questions by using the Freedom of Information Act, um, known as FOIA, to get public records. So you may already have the kind of relationship with your school administration or local police where you can just ask for records and data. And if that's the case, that is fantastic. Um, but the more formal way to do this is through FOIA, uh, which requires government bodies to provide uh, the public access to records within a set time frame. So every state's public records laws are different, but in Illinois, uh, once you file a request for access to records um, that are kept by the government body, that government has five days to respond to you, either to ask for an extension or provide the records. Um, so if that formal process appeals to you uh, as a student journalist, that's where we recommend that you start. Um, we first filed a FOIA request when we started this reporting um, with school FOIA officers asking for records of police involvement on campus. And here's what that 
FOIA request looked like, and we can share that template with you later so that you can use it too. Um, what we learned pretty quickly is that not every school had records specifically about tickets. And so, uh, and, and that reason is that they're not required to. They're required to keep some information about, about police on campus, but not specifically ticketing. So then we turned to the police departments that had jurisdiction over the school we were examining. Um, in, in many cases, you might know that, that a school resource officer on your campus is often affiliated with um, your local police force. So we went to those uh, police departments, and this is what the FOIA looked like to police departments. So, you know, we, just like you, do things by trial and error sometimes, and over time tweaked our FOIA um, to become more specific to what we were looking for. Um, we found that we were most successful when we asked the police to provide us records of tickets that were written to juveniles, that's, you know, anybody younger than 18, at the school address. Um, and that was one way that we narrowed down tickets that were written, you know, likely to students. And we'll share this FOIA with you, too. Um, we do want to pause and show you the types of records that you might get back and that, that we actually did get back. It was a little bit of everything. So we got some, um, some information in spreadsheets and sometimes we got um, sort of long like printouts of, of police activity on campus. And in some cases we got actual tickets and like the copies of tickets themselves. Um, so we took all of those records and we entered key information from those records into a spreadsheet. So information about um, the school and about the police agency and how many tickets were issued during the time frame we were looking at and for what reasons. Um, so all of that got entered into a spreadsheet that we could later use to analyze, to answer some of those big questions that we had in the beginning. So once you get all those records or the data, your reporting doesn't end. Maybe you've confirmed that tickets are written to students at your school. A good question to ask next is, is this practice legal in your state? So to understand more about what the law says in Illinois, we're going to refer, refer you to two important bits of Illinois school code. One law says that schools can't find students as discipline. And... Um, that's what you're looking at right now. It says, you know, a student may not issue, be issued a monetary fine as a disciplinary consequence. Um, in this case, what's often happening is that school administrators are telling the school resource officers, the police officers in your school, that a student has broken a local law. And then the officer is writing a ticket that has a fine attached to it. So as we reported and as we discovered this, we learned that many people felt that this violated the intent of that law um, that's on the screen. We also um, were able to show that since 2019, state law also has banned schools from alerting police about truant students so that they can be fined. However, we found through all those requests uh, to the schools and the police departments, that this is still happening in many districts in Illinois. We found it in more than four dozen, and you may find that in yours as well. That would be a very important finding. Right, so once you have collected all this information, all this data, um, or you've used our data, uh, however you decide to go about this, um, and you have an understanding of what the law says is allowed and what isn't, now who do you talk to about it? You're gonna to have to conduct interviews. Who do you interview? Um, for our stories, we talked to dozens and dozens of students and families and school principals and deans and police officers. And then we also went out to local hearings uh, and courthouses to learn what happens after the ticket is written um, and saw that firsthand. So, and you can go to those too. We would actually recommend that most cities and villages in Illinois um, post the dates and times for their ticket hearings, it's called administrative adjudication, um, on their websites. And sometimes those hearings take place in police stations or at a city hall at your local village hall. Um, and one question you can ask if you go there is, is whether students who are ticketed are required to go to the hearing and whether there's a cost to attend the hearing which is actually pretty common and can be important for your readers to know. 
So we're going to share with you now some of the key things that we found after analyzing the data about tickets and conducting all those interviews. Um, and hopefully these findings and will lead to questions and for you to think about and stories that you might want to do. First, we, we were able to tell readers why the tickets were written. So this is how we explained it in the story. Um, the, you know, words that are up on the screen now, we were able to say, you know, how many times students were ticketed for various reasons. Like you could get all this information from your school and realize there were, you know, 15 students that were ticketed for vaping um, and, you know, the different reasons and really kind of parse that out for the students and families who are reading um, or listening to your uh, news report. And um, so definitely look for, you know, why students were ticketed in your, ticketed in your school and what the most, uh, you know, common reasons were and how often. That's one thing to look for. Right. It was it was really useful to be able to tell people how often um, young people were ticketed at school. And that's definitely a question that you could take on by doing this reporting. You know, how common is it for students to be ticketed? Um, we were also able to explain how expensive some of the fines for students were. So we found that state law um, in Illinois allows fines for ordinance violations, which is what, what these local laws are, um, to be as much as $750. And some communities we found do impose fines and penalties of that amount. So you could answer the question, how costly are the fines here in, in my school? Um, can students do community service instead? We found that in some, in some communities, community service was an option instead of paying a fine, and in others, it was not. Uh, the fine was, was required. Um, you could ask, can uh, students who don't pay their, their fines and fees be sent to debt collection? You know, what are the consequences if they can't pay? Those are all things that we explored in our reporting. And sometimes the answers to those questions are written right in your city um, or town's municipal code. So this is, this is another good reporting tip. The municipal code that tells you what your local, um, what your local laws are and what the consequences are, um, are often online and searchable. So that's that's a good a good place to kind of start to understand um, what types of laws are being enforced. So as you pursue this reporting, know that your journalism can really make changes. Um, a few things to tell you about after we published our reporting, which was back in April, the Illinois school superintendent directed the leaders of all of your schools, the schools in Illinois, to stop working with police to ticket students. Um, so it would definitely be good if you're pursuing this story to find out whether they have listened to the state school superintendent and stopped working with police to ticket students. Um, what other things that happened, the governor and the legislators said they would work to end this practice. Um, there have been some investigations into schools by the Illinois Attorney General. Um, so those investigations are pending, and um, the comptroller's office has stopped collecting debts. So Jennifer talked about the debt collection, debts related to truancy tickets. They will not help um, your towns collect those debts anymore. And your work could also have really big impact in your communities. So after, uh, after the story published, the... Uh, newspaper in McHenry County, Illinois, which is a suburb north of Chicago, um, that has a, a student newspaper called the McHenry Messenger, decided to, uh, to read our story, look in the database, see how often students were ticketed at their school, and then pursue uh, a story, which was really, really exciting to see. Um, we're now going to ask uh, Dane Urbach, the newspaper advisor, and Vanessa Moreno, the student who uh, wrote the story to join us on the screen. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Vanessa is the uh, McHenry Messenger's news editor. And I as I said, Dane is the advisor um, of the student newspaper. Um, so Vanessa reported on police ticketing at McHenry in May and just did a really, really fantastic job. She interviewed a student who had been ticketed just you know a couple weeks earlier 
Um, she interviewed the school principal, deans, and others. Um, her, her story really shed light on the practices at her high school, and we're really eager for her to share with you how she approached the story. So thank you both again for, for joining us uh, in this event today. Uh, Dane, I think I'll start with you. Um, you were the first one to read the story of the two of you. And I'm wondering what your reaction was after you read the investigation and what you decided to do. Yeah, I feel like I saw it on like Instagram and I was like, oh, this looks interesting and kind of swiped past it. And then it popped up again and again. And I was like, fine, I just need to sit and read this. Um, and I think I must have gotten it was a really long article. And I think I must have gotten through like the first uh, several paragraphs before I was like, it just got me thinking about how does this impact our school? Um, and so I sort of put it in front of Vanessa and said, what do you think of this? And she was like, this is interesting. And I, I'll never kind of forget, like we we had um, our class at the end of the day. So we both went home and we're both reading it and kind of messaging each other at the same time. Like, oh, did you get to this part? Oh, what did you think of that thing? And I think we we're both really surprised that McHenry High School was prominently mentioned in the article. And we're like, wait, what? Like, so we had our question answered about how does this impact our school before we, you know, even got to the end of the article. Um, the article itself had a reference to um, something that had gone on with a student in our school. And then um, I'm, there were a couple of little quotes from our principal. And so we were like, a lot of this has already, you know, started. This conversation is already happening at our school. We need to dig deeper now. So, yeah, I mean, and I guess Vanessa can kind of maybe talk a little bit too about how she reacted when she first read the article, but that was kind of where it all started. That's a big plug for Instagram for getting our stories on Instagram. Um, thank you for sharing that. I did not know that. Um, Vanessa, please share your reactions when when you first uh, were reading the story and the conversation you had with your teacher. So like he said, it was the end of the year and he shared it with me. Like we read it kind of at the same time. And I was shocked that our school was mentioned a lot actually. So that's when we started like investigating more. Did you know that police were issuing tickets to students at the McHenry? There's, so people know there are two campuses uh, for the McHenry High School, a freshman campus, and then a campus for 10th through 12th graders. So did you know that police were issuing tickets at the school? No, I actually didn't know police could issue tickets at all. So you probably read that with some surprise too. Like, wow, I did not know this was happening. Um, and then you decided to investigate it yourself and and do all the work. What, what was it like reporting on this topic at your school and in your community? I mean, it was kind of difficult. Some people weren't really willing to talk and it was difficult to find students who had been ticketed. I actually had help from a freshman over at the other campus and she found a list of students that were ticketed. Um, and if I could chime in, because one of my jobs, like I teach mostly at the freshman campus. In fact, newspaper is the only class I teach at the upper campus. Um, one of the weird parts is we um, we found a lot of upperclassmen just didn't want to talk about it at all. Um, we were able to kind of like do a little reporting just by saying who asking the rest of the class, who do you know that might have gotten ticketed? And then when we got a name, we'd ask and they'd be like, no, including the student that was featured in the Chicago Tribune ProPublica article um, from McHenry. He just didn't he wanted to put it past him and didn't want to talk about it anymore. So. Um, we actually found, I think, three freshmen who, I mean, maybe because they were just a little more naive, um, maybe because they were just a little more fired up about their tickets. Um, I think we found about three. And then um, I did kind of like my background teacher due diligence to see, to make sure that they had permission from their parents for us to tell their story. And two parents declined. They both said that they don't want it in, in the article. So only one student's parent actually agreed. Um, and that's, that was definitely one of the obstacles for us. An obstacle, but also such an, such a lesson because you are in the school, you know, people like, you know, you have access and the ability to 
you know, really be on the ground there and talk with people and find out who is affected by something, who's, you know, who's really impacted by this policy of police ticketing. And you, you have um, insight and access in a way that we really don't. Um, so to be a student journalist and report on your school, you're in a very unique uh, position. And there's a, there are just a lot of benefits to that. And it sounds like you really, uh, really use those those benefits and um, and also use them in a very judicious way, you know, seeking permission from parents and and all of that. So really, uh, really interesting. Uh, Dane, were you faced with any pushback or opposition? You're the teacher. You're the one, you're the one, you know, kind of the conduit between the administration and, and the students. Um, any any pushback? I will say that I've I've gotten pushback. <laughs> Um, in my job previously, but not for this story so much. And I think that has a lot to do with Vanessa framing this as like an opportunity for, for our school to react and comment. You know, like the news is already broken. Like it's already out there that our school issues tickets. I don't recall where on the list we were, but I mean, I think we are high-ish on the list of how many tickets were being um you know, being get handed out to kids. So our school like was not only aware of the practice and um, not only aware that there is now this article out there, but they were also, I, I feel like um, Vanessa and I talked a little bit about how do we approach these conversations, um, but I think she did a really good job at basically just saying, what, how do you, now that this news is out, how do you feel about it? What has been the reaction from the community? And um, and what do you still, what, what about this story do you still have to say, you know, because it might've only been a sound bite that was released in the article or so from, from the people from our school, at least. So she basically gave them a platform to kind of explain themselves. Personally, I think that maybe giving them the microphone, so to speak, might've also given them an opportunity to say more than they wanted to at times. Um, and they may have revealed a bit more than they intended to by speaking um, to us. <laughs> Maybe they were a little naive in thinking that a, a student journalist wouldn't like pick up on some of the nuance of what they're saying. But uh, I think, I don't think pushback is the right word that we received. Um, I think we got a lot of cooperation and I think that just has to do with the way um, Vanessa approached the story. Right, you gave them an opportunity to speak, to add, nuance or more information and um, a platform. So as also a good lesson there that other student journalists could take. You can, you know, look up in, in the database that we gave you the link for earlier and see how many tickets and then use that to go and say, look, this information is already out there. Um, clearly, people now know that that students are ticketed at our school. What can you tell me about this? Are you still doing this? Are you, you know, what, um, you know, why are you doing it? And, and you know, give them, give them a chance to talk about it. So it's really great. Um, Vanessa, I'm curious, while you were, you were reporting on this and interviewing so many people, what did you learn? Um, or what's, and also what really surprised you when you were, you know, talking with people at your school about this? So something surprising was that, for example, the Dean, he didn't really take this seriously. He was like, this is just the media spinning an unfair narrative or something like that, touched in my article. I thought that was weird because we obviously know that tickets do happen. So he was trying to say it was it wasn't happening, or like it, this is not no big deal, or um, you know, what, what was he? What do you think he was trying to get across uh, to you? Was trying to say that it wasn't like a big deal. Yeah, I I, I saw that in your story too. Uh, I think you did a good job of providing context to that statement. Um, and um, after your story published, have you been able to track any impact from your reporting? Not really. I feel like at times our school doesn't care about things they probably should. Uh, did you hear back from other students or people in, in newspaper class? Um, I mean, people from my newspaper class, they were really supportive, but that's pretty much it. 
And I'll chime in here too, um, just to kind of piggyback on what Vanessa said, like, I feel like we definitely felt the impact of our story being pushed out there. Um, we've never had a social media response like we got, like we were getting comments from across the country, journalism teachers and professors, um, journalists from different corners and stuff. They, they were really championing what we said. They were commenting on our, our administrators and their quotes. They were commenting on what our students were saying. I mean, it was pretty, it was kind of a crazy ride um, for a few weeks. Um, I, but, but just to kind of echo what Vanessa said, it seemed like it jumped over our community. And that was very frustrating for us. Like the very people we wanted to respond to this story either kind of shrugged it off um, or, or kind of ignored it. And I, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, on camera and being recorded. So there's only so much I can say on behalf of our school and stuff. But I do feel like um, to some extent, I think our school stayed quiet because they didn't want it to get bigger. They didn't respond to it. They didn't retweet it. They didn't really want to talk too much about it. Um, and so I don't think that was surprising. But, you know, we really we really thought our community would probably be up in arms about it. And they didn't. So I do think that is maybe guiding a little bit of what we feel like we might want to do next. Uh, Vanessa and I have talked very little, but we have asked this question now of like, is our school still doing this? And if they are, well, what do we do about that as journalists now? And and obviously that's the question I'm asking, you know, Vanessa, I've asked Vanessa, like, what do you think we should do about this? Um, so that's a conversation that might be coming up too. That's, um... Really interesting. If you decide to um, try to find out whether tickets are still being issued, whether asking them or, or filing those Freedom of Information Act requests that we showed you earlier um, in the session, please let us know what you find because, right, like what do you do next? Do you, how do you kind of keep this going? One thing at ProPublica, we definitely keep on stories um, and you know, it's not, we don't write one story and, and move on, um, you know, like with the price kids pay stories, we've written a whole bunch of stories since April um, related to ticketing in schools. So definitely would encourage uh, continued spotlight on this issue, especially, you know, McHenry had so many, so many tickets. Um, Vanessa, what tips do you have for other high school students hoping to report on this issue? Um, I think like a tip would be to start looking at the database that you had. That's like the first thing I did to confirm that tickets were actually happening. And then just reaching out to people. Um, is there anything I didn't ask either of you that you'd want uh, to share with the audience? Um, Vanessa and I did talk while we were prepping about this, about one thing that we found surprising that we haven't talked about yet. Um, and Vanessa, if you want to chime in and talk more about it, because this was definitely your adventure, um, our student resource officers did not talk to us. They refused to. Um, they we We sent emails and then we did, Vanessa, did I like send you into the hallway to chase after one of them once after they walked past our classroom? I don't, this seemed like something I would do. Um, they, they, we, they, they just didn't want us around. We sent a photographer to take a picture to try to represent, like maybe they had some tickets like in their desk or something like that, or maybe we could just take a picture of them and they refused. We found that really surprising that they didn't want to, well, I guess maybe Maybe they, it's not surprising that they didn't want to cooperate, but at the same time, these are their tickets. This is their opportunity to explain why. And uh, so, yeah, we thought that was a, a surprise. Um, Vanessa, anything to add to that? I will say that eventually we contacted the police department directly and that worked better. I saw that in your story too. Um, yeah, but interesting that you, you know, they weren't going to talk to you in, in your school, um, that you felt like you would have to like, chase them down to talk to them and that they weren't accessible. Um, but good for continuing to try to get their point of view. Uh, 
I love that persistence. Um, that's that's another good lesson for for all student journalists. Um, you know, persistence does does pay off. Um, we're we're going to sort of pivot now um, and kind of turn it over to our Q and A portion. Um, but first of all, thank you so much to Dane and and to Vanessa um, for giving us this insight into actually you know doing this this story, pursuing it on your own um, as a student journalist. It was awesome work and and so exciting to see um, both of you here and and explaining how you persevered <laughs> and kept on the story. Um, in your school. That's awesome. Um, so before we we completely turn it over to the Q&A portion, but um, we'd like to share a link to our event survey in the chat box. So appreciate your feedback if you can fill that out. Um, and although cameras for this session are turned off, we would love to invite you to use your microphone and ask a question. Um, and to do that, just click on the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen, and we'll just hand you the mic. Uh, we know that we have a number of classrooms joining our program today, um, which is fantastic. We're so glad you're here, um, including students at the School of the New York Times and from several universities and high schools across the country. Thank you so much for being here. I see we have uh, some questions in the in the chat and some raised hands. Okay. Sorry about this. Make sure, okay, Beatrice has a hand raised. Hello. Hi, Beatrice. Um, hi. Yeah, my name is Ishika. Beatrice is, is one of our advisors. Oh. Um, my question was, um, so I tried to file a FOIA request. And um, they said, for a bunch of them, they said no responsive records. So um, first of all, like, how do you make sure that your request is like valid and that they have to respond to it instead of um, responding with the no responsive records? And secondly, what kinds of information should we be asking for in these FOIA requests? Those are all really good questions. And actually you're pointing out something that we encounter all the time, um, which is you ask for something that you think a government agency has, and then they come back to you and say, we don't have any responsive records. So that happens for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they really might not keep any record that looks anything like what you need. We found that a lot with schools. So we mentioned at the top of the program that we first went to schools and said, please tell us, um, please give us any records that you have of tickets being issued at school. Well, schools aren't required to keep those specific ticketing records. So many of, the, of those schools came back to us and said, we don't have any responsive records. And that's why we went to police them. Um, so, so that may be the case. That may be why you're, you're being told there aren't any responsive records. Um, the other reason you might get that response back is that you simply ask for the records in a way that they're not kept. So we sometimes um, ask for a lot of information um, about, about tickets that were issued that included things like gender and age, and race, um, or you know, the address um, of the school that we were looking for, and sometimes police agencies came back to us and said, "We don't have a record that has all that stuff in it." And we would say, we would go back and negotiate with them and say, "Well, do you have anything that has some of this, some of this information in it?" So you may be getting like a very um, a strict response from somebody who's saying, "Well, I don't have the record that has everything." you asked for in it. Um, so it sort of behooves you to then like reach out and ask, you know, why don't, do you not have any records or do you not have any records that has every single thing that I asked for? Um, so I think that's that's just one one thing to, to keep in mind. As for what you should be asking for, the this is a little bit of trial and error too. Um, we, we would find that um, asking for a big pile of information sometimes did not um, help us in the long run. So if we asked for too many very like discrete things, um, it, it became not helpful. So being very narrow um, about what it is you want to see in the record, I think will help you. Um, age was really important. 
or some sort of indicator of whether it was a juvenile who was being ticketed. Um, the reason for the ticket was very important, right? And then if there was some sort of fine associated with it, with that ticket, that also was important. I hope I answered that, so, Jenny. Do you have any other things to um, add? So should I call them like on the phone with the FOIA that they sent me back and then just like go through each one and like ask if they have anything? Okay. Um, and then I just had one more question, if that's okay. Um, so if like, like you guys mentioned, your school resource officer um, didn't want to talk to you. Um, so like, because we still need an opinion and like our police department also hasn't been like as responsive. So do you guys have ways of like, I don't want to say forcing, but like, <laughs> like ways that we can get around uh, them not being able, uh, not wanting to talk to us? Um, I would try as many people as possible. I mean, I would try the school, the people at your school, the principal, the deans, the, um, it sounds like the school resource officers aren't responding. I would try to put some, if, if they're not uh, returning your calls, uh, try email and uh, emailing your questions, uh, letting them know that you're, you're working on the story, that you want to give them, make sure that their voice is heard, that you want to know their point of view, um, you want to give them a chance to respond. So I, I would, um, you know, just try to, you know, talk to them, email them, let them know that that this is their opportunity to share their point of view. Um, also with the FOIA, I definitely um, endorse calling the FOIA officer, walking through what documents they do have, um, and just trying to get a handle of the language that they use and, you know, explain to them. I mean, FOIA officers are, are you know, can be very helpful. Um, and I would just explain, like, this is my this is my goal. This is the information I'm trying to get. These are records I'm trying to get. Can you explain to me how you keep them? And just kind of work with them and have a conversation. Um, you know, public bodies, FOIA officers don't need to answer questions, right? So you can't say, you know, they're not going to, um, they're not obligated to answer your questions. But you can um, take those questions to the people who have the answers, um, the, uh, the public officials, and say, you know, not under FOIA, but just because, you know, you are a public official uh, who should have some accountability. I, I'm a reporter. I'd like to know the answers to these questions. I'll also tell you one thing that sometimes works. Um, this is pro tip. Um, when we get close to publishing a story and we've had difficulty um, getting someone to respond to questions that we have or have a conversation with us, um, we do a thing out of fairness that's called a no surprises letter. And we reach out to them and say, hey, this is, you know, we've been we've been reporting about this. We've been trying to reach you. Um, we are writing a story. The story is going to say the following things. And this is sort of your last chance to, to respond to that and, and tell us, you know, and be heard. Um, you know, we work very hard to explain to people what the, what the story is, is going to say and be transparent um, about what the reporting process and, and what's coming. And sometimes that kind of notice that, hey, this story is coming, it's going to publish, and and this is what it's going to say. It's going to say that you are not commenting on this. Um, sometimes that does sort of prompt someone to to call you up and say, okay, fine, <laughs> you know, I'll I'll explain this. Um, so it's just it's good to maybe give a last reminder um, before your story publishes to that person, um, you know, the police chief or whoever that that the story's coming and that they have one more opportunity to respond before it publishes. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, one more piece of advice is that um, we're super lucky today that we have the Student Press Law Center in attendance as well. They're an organization I have admired since I was in Vanessa's shoes as a high school journalist. And um, you know, actually used to dream one day of working there. <laughs> um, but they are here uh, watching today and just um, want to remind all the student journalists who are listening today that they are very happy to assist student journalists in working on their FOIA requests, responding to issues that come up. So you run into a wall with your FOIA request. Um, you know, you can reach out to the Student Press Law Center. You know, their website's very accessible and they will, their job, their, what they, they do is help student journalists just like you. So shout out to the Student Press Law Center and the work that they do and, and reach out to them for help with your FOIA challenges. 
Um, I saw that Brian's hand was raised. Uh, Brian, we can un unmute you and uh, you can ask your question, please. Sure thing. Thank you uh, for doing this. My question was, how can someone reporting on this issue humanize ticketing data when you may not have a student connection or a family connection at a school district? You know, a lot of times this data is protected because of FERPA, you know, on the specifics. So what strategies do you guys have on connecting those dots? That's a fantastic question. And, and somebody actually mentioned this in the chat earlier. Um, they wondered if we if we got student names um, from police and the answer is no. Um, Brian, real quick, wh who are you with? Um, sure. are you I'm an alum of the Emerging Reporter Program, uh, but I work for St. Louis Public Radio, the NPR in St. Louis, Missouri. Amazing. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, so one way that we really got access to the most students was simply by showing up at the ticket hearings. Um, so for many communities, they require students to show up and go before a hearing officer or sometimes an actual judge um, to, to kind of like plead their case or defend themselves if they want to defend themselves against the ticket. Um, so they were physically there in those hearings. And so Jody and I went all over the state to, I don't know, more, more than 50 of, of these hearings. And we were there, um, we would often encounter you know, a dozen or more students. Um, inevitably, when you start talking to one student, they know a couple more, their cousin or their older sister had been ticketed. And so once you start making those connections um, with, with students who are, you know, out experiencing the ticketing process, um, you just simply meet more and more and more. Thank you so much. I think we had a hand raised from Melissa, Melissa Sickman. Hi, thanks for uh, answering my question. Uh, I'm the director of the National Center for Juvenile Justice, so I'm not a journalist, but I'm always interested and have talked with the uh, ProPublica folks before. Um, I was sort of wondering if the the youth journalists doing this, you know, story in their school had had an opportunity or thought to talk to reach out and do interviews with local advocates because this topic of fines and fees in juvenile courts is a big issue where you know reform around the country is trying to get courts to reduce or eliminate the use of fines and fees and I bet a lot of uh, folks aren't real, you know, were until this story of ProPublica came out, they weren't thinking about the schools or the ticketing by, you know, by officers, because that often is, you know, a step removed from real state juvenile court. Um, and those advocates could have a lot of good perspective, could perhaps connect you with, with other youth, um, and certainly could help engage with, you know, more reform efforts to sort of push push things a little further to uh, try to end it. So no, we didn't reach out to advocates. Um, the story was kind of rushed. It was the end of the year. It was like finals week, but we would probably do something now. We would probably continue this story now and reach out to advocates. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, you can reach out to me at ncjj.org uh, to get if you want to get in touch. We know some advocacy groups in Illinois and others that are more national. Um, another thing, you know, in the last question um, about, you know, sort of getting other information and, and finding things out, I would be curious to know what was in the either uh, contracts or guidance manuals for the SROs in the schools? Are they kind of being told to do this or is it happening more informally through, you know, administrators or just, you know, they're trying to make money for the town? Vanessa, did you get the vibe? I kind of don't forget. Did you get the vibe that um, the police were like not telling the SROs that they couldn't comment wasn't was that the case in our in our community? Yeah, that was the case. They couldn't talk about the ticketing. Yeah, so I don't think it came from the school. Oh no, um, no. What I'm thinking of is there. You know, not every place. In fact, probably not most places. When there is a police department brought into a school for you know to be SROs, there's sometimes, you know, sort of a contract that says, this is, these are the things you are to do. This is the boundaries between your involvement in our discipline and school personnel's involvement. 
And so I'd be interested to see whether the actions about whether to, you know, is there the statement of what the law is? Is there, you know, the do's and don'ts of it? Or is that absent from the document? Or is there no such document at all, which could be another whole issue altogether? Yeah, that's a great question, Melissa. Um, we when we first did our our first pass through asking schools what records they had, one of the things we asked for were any memorandum of understanding documents that they had, which would be the contracts that Melissa's talking about, um, that would spell out like what are the duties of the SRO in school. Um, we my the best of my recollection, um, and Jody can correct me if she remembers something different, is that we never saw a mention of issuing tickets as part of the SRO's duty. It more broadly would say things like, you know, it's it's the officer's job to enforce the law, right? Um, so that that would sometimes, there's my teenager, um, <laughs> that would sometimes um, be in the MOU. But we very rarely saw something, I think, that was like an explicit directive to, um, you know, to issue tickets to students um, or even a prohibition, even though there were places in Illinois that had directed the SRO in their school, you know, not to ticket. One thing that was in the MOUs frequently was that they would share information so that the school administration and the police would share information about students. So that goes to, you know, the administrators finding, uh, you know, a school dean being, alert, being alerted that there's a bait pen on the floor in the hallway. And then they go and tell the, school resource officer, you know, student dropped the vape pen in the hallway, and then the police officer goes and writes that student a ticket for vaping. So these contracts or these MOUs do um, outline that the um, there can be sharing of information about students, which is relevant to this issue of disciplining students uh, with police tickets. That Again, something, something that's not, you know, tracked by mm -hmm. the state or by the U.S. Department um, of education, civil rights data collection. So, you know, again, why why we thought it was important to really do a deep dive investigation into ticketing because it is this kind of black hole of information that you like. Even Vanessa in her school did not know that police were handing out tickets to students at at her school, and she's a student in the school, um, which is not uncommon. I think unless you're directly impa impacted, affected by this, you're ticketed, you might not know that police in your school who you know, are in the hallways are, you know, giving students these fines. Uh, yeah, it's, it's so true. Say so, thank you very much, Melissa, for bringing up MOUs and, and for the good questions. I think um, Maxina has a question coming up. Hi, uh, I am not Maxina. I'm her mother, Clarissa. And uh, we're in California, so Maxina could not attend this meeting because she's still in school. So I'm here for her. Um, but I am, so I, there's two things. The first thing is that I am extremely interested in knowing what your advice is on how Vanessa can pursue this topic with her school and try to get some sort of positive outcome where, um, as Myrna um, mentions, that ticketing and um, ticketing in the schools is more or less a school to prison pipeline. So um, I, you know, I, I'm extremely interested in learning about that. The second thing is that um, for my high school journalist who's still in school, um, she really would love more of these kind of webinars. And so um, as, a, as a journalist in learning how to find information um, for investigative reporting. So that's, um, we would just love to have more of that. Um, so thank you, you can go ahead and unmute me. I mean, um, put me back on mute. Thank you for being here uh, on behalf of your daughter. That is, that's dedication. Um, and I, I love to hear it. Uh, so good question about like how to move forward. So for, for Vanessa and for the, the student journalists here in Illinois, um, you know, we mentioned earlier that the Illinois state school superintendent sent pretty strongly worded directive 
to all of your schools, all the leaders of your schools and districts um, to say, essentially stop doing this. Um, that if, if you as a school um, are allowing the police to, to participate in school level discipline, that you're advocating your responsibility. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty serious directive. It's out there on the internet, you can read it. We wrote about it um, as well. So I think like a first stop to moving forward with this story is simply to go back and ask, are you still doing this? Um, are police still writing tickets in, in my school, even though the state superintendent has said, you know, to knock it off? Um, you know, in California, it reminds me, I, I think that there was ticketing going on in the Los Angeles schools for a while, and there was some, um, some movement to pull back on at least some portion of ticketing and, um, and, and, and practices for at least some age groups of students. So maybe it's worth going back and saying, did, did they stop ticketing as well? Did they keep their, their promise to, to curb ticketing? Um, I think that's, that's like a good first story that, that you could do moving forward. Um, and it sounds like Vanessa is kind of going down that pathway. Jody, do you have other ideas? No, I think that's a great first step. Um, ask them if they're still doing it. Try to get the data or just you know either ask them or through a records request to find out this school year, how many tickets have been issued. Ask around at your schools, use your contacts, um, you know, your fellow students, your classmates and, and try to see, I mean, people talk to, to each other and um, see if they're still, still ticketing and for what reasons. And especially, are they still ticketing for truancy? Not especially, really, are they ticketing for anything? But as we discussed, truancy is, you know, they're really, you know, it's blatantly illegal to do that. So, you know, ask the questions, try to try to find out if it's still happening. Um, Mel uh, Melissa put uh, a link in the chat about the court fees. If I could say something about that, it is, um, there is work being done by advocates in Illinois and estates across uh, the country to try to eliminate fines and fees in juvenile court. Again, that's state court, different from these ordinance violation tickets. And there are um, efforts in Illinois as well. There was a Supreme Court task force that was is looking into that. Um, they should have recommendations soon. There's a, a bill um, that's been introduced in, uh, this, in the state house. And um, that is something else that could be worth looking into um, for if, you know, if you're a student or just a journalist in general, these efforts um, to eliminate fines and fees in juvenile court. And it does raise questions of, okay, if the fines and fees are eliminated in juvenile court, but they're still being assessed in these local courts, not courts, these like local hearings where these you know, ordinance violation tickets are being given, well, how, what does that mean? You know, why are students, why are young people going to still have these fines in um, in these you know for these uh, local ordinance violation tickets so it's sort of two different issues but definitely definitely related and there is work being done uh, in Illinois about that yeah just a reminder um raise your hand if you have a question to ask and we'll pass you the mic but in the meantime there are some really good questions in the Q&A um, including a question about beat reporting and like how you go about you know, developing a beat covering schools. Um, I love that question. Jody and I are both, um, you know, longtime education reporters, written a lot about schools. Jody, what what is your hot take on how to really go about developing um, as a schools reporter? Well, I would say to you know, start talking to people in your school if you're a student journalist. Uh, start meeting people. Start going to your school board meetings. See what. Uh, what issues are on the agenda? What are they talking about? Uh, who is coming to speak at public comments? Uh, go back and read uh, prior prior uh, board meeting minutes from the school board uh, meetings. You know, try going to your your city council, your local government meetings too, and see what's you know what you know they're they're talking about. Look at look at the budget. Try to understand the numbers. Uh, what's what money is being spent at your school and on what. Um, I, I think this is actually probably a really good question for Dane and Vanessa too. Um, but, you know, what what's teacher, uh, like what's the spending on teachers? What's teacher retention like? How, what's the, look at, I don't know, I'm just going to keep say, saying things, but, um, you know, there's so much data out there where you can really look at attendance rates, 
uh, dropout rates, who's taking AP classes, advanced classes at your school, are there disparities in, in access to those classes? Um, there's a lot of great guides out there, uh, reporting guides on you know, how to cover the education beat. You can you know, do some Googling, Education Writers Association. I would recommend uh, joining and you will get learn so much and get uh, just so much information. They offer a lot of free programming as well. So I would start with the Education Writers Association uh, and, and go from there. Can I make a plug for data? So, so Jody mentioned that there's a lot of data out there. Um, if you don't already know how to work with Google Sheets or Excel, um, this is your sign to go learn. There increasingly is so much data um, that's produced out of schools that can tell you anything from, you know, like what we're looking at right here, um, you know, criminal justice issues that are happening in school, all the way to, you know, grades and, um, you know, and salaries. All of those um, live in structured data forms. So learn how to use Excel, learn how to use Google Sheets. Um, and I'll also tell you that working a school speed um, is, is really about being a busybody and, and trying to figure everything out. Jody mentioned um, like school board agendas. So I used to go and ask for any presentation, like a copy of anything that was going to be presented in the school board meeting. So slides or packets of information or reports. Um, so you can see like the day-to-day -day operations, like what's going on, you know, in the school that is important enough to be mentioned in the context of a school board meeting. Um, the other thing that will guide you to records that your school district keeps um, is your district's records retention policy. So most states um, require government bodies, including schools, to lay out how long they're going to keep any ind individual type of record that they make. Um, so that could be that could be personnel information, that could be salaries, it could be any number of things. Um, but if you go and ask for their records retention policy, what you'll find is a list of all the stuff that they have and how long they have to keep it. And that's a good roadmap for like what records might be available. Dane, Vanessa, anything to add as schools reporters? I um the the thing that this question made me think about is kind of different from the actual question. So apologies if this goes off the rails a bit, but like you know, our student newspaper, the McHenry Messenger, isn't really, doesn't really, isn't an, ed, doesn't have an education beat, you know, because we are a school paper. We just cover what's going on in our community. So it's already kind of an education beat, right? So what this question made me think about is like what Vanessa was really doing here is more of an investigative kind of beat. And so to like, translate that question into something else that might be relevant for members of our audience is how do you start investigating in a student newspaper where a lot of what you cover is who won what basketball game um and what's what good netflix show is worth reviewing right we um i think what, what we've had some success with is really annoying administrators for um, data. Like we haven't done a lot of FOIA requests, but um, we do have relationships with administrators in order to get those numbers of all kinds of things. Like we have existing relationships. I have colleagues, you know, who are people that can run numbers for us and stuff. So um, I like to think of that question um, a little bit and like, how can you get someone to start doing investigations? And I think um, we've had some conversations about data I think that if you have a, a student or you are a student who really loves looking at numbers and data and who isn't afraid to ask, like send cold call emails to people or knock on office doors and request things directly, it's really hard to say no to a student when you're an administrator, right? Um, like that's, I think, a really easy entry into becoming kind of starting an investigations section of your student newspaper or starting like an investigations beat. Um, and then the data can come from other places later, but you might as well mine the data where you can get it pretty easily. And I know that probably puts you, I know you guys are talking about like um, how it's hard for you. We're the, you know, students are the boots on the ground in the schools. It's harder for you guys to get that data. Um, but for students, it might even be a little easier. Um, just to be able to like, you know, that one, that one assistant principal that came and chatted with you in the hallway, you can be like, by the way, you know, what, what are the, what's the truancy rate look like this year? And what kind of data do you have on that? Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm talking a bit too long, but I figured 
that might be a, that's the, what I was thinking about with that question. I agree. You don't need permission to go to your school. You get, you have the pass. You can go into your school every day. We, we can't. You are there. You are on the ground. Um, one thing that might translate to doing investigative journalism at the high school level um, is something, you know, we, we do this at ProPublica a lot is where we do what's called a, a call out. Like we ask people to respond to, you know, our question. Like we want more information about a certain topic and we get, you know, people write in and respond and, and they become sources and, and it's how we, we, you know, learn more about an issue. You could always try that too, you know, ask, you know, in, in, you know, kind of a, a call out way, a form, or, or, you know, you're, of course, you see students in the hallways and teachers and administrators all day long, but, you know, they could, you know, maybe submit some ideas of what they want to see investigated, what is important to them, what their concerns are at school right now. And that could provide some, some leads as well. If you want to Judy, do um, could I yeah. chime in really quick? Um, Please. Just for the students and the advisors, high school advisors that might be like in the in the crowd right now, Instagram is a great, I'm plugging Instagram again, I'm sorry. Um, Instagram is a really great way to do this. Um, we've kind of noticed on social media that a lot of parents are on Facebook, a lot of teachers are on Twitter, and a lot of, and all of our students are on Instagram. And this is how we engage with them on social media. So in our Instagram stories, if we put out a, hey, who has this kind of experience reach out with us, we have a lot of success that way. So that kind of, again, between students and between the student publication and um, and the rest of the school's you know, population, like you might have a lot of success with students that way within, you know, like a, a student newspaper context. Um, Vanessa is currently working on a story where we found some sources, quite a, you know, a good handful of sources um, that way. It was, it's kind of, um, it's about a different subject, like opioid, uh, like crisis in our community and stuff. And we had some people reach out to us that way where, I mean, you can't just walk up to a kid and be like, have you lost a loved one to, to opioids? Um, so this is a way for students to kind of communicate a little bit more personally one-on-one. -on -one. Those are great, great tips um, for everybody who's listening. And we've actually had a lot of questions in the chat um, about how to become an investigative reporter. And, you know, I always tell people that I talk to about, you know, how to become an investigative reporter, that it really begins with just curiosity and reading investigations and seeing what went into them and that that will be really instructive. Um, so, you know, read Jody's investigations. Um, Vanessa, you're well on your way to becoming an investigative reporter. You're doing investigations as a student journalist. Um, can you, you know, just tell us a little bit about how, how you're doing that? Like, what are your tips for learning how to do this type of work? So my tips are just to, like you said, to read investigations, to learn from them, and then to just send emails to everyone, to all your sources, and keep annoying them until they answer. That's fantastic. Curiosity is everything, right? Um, thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you for your thoughts. And thank you. Thank you, Dane. Um, this has been so much fun, uh, but that's our time for today. So I want to thank Dane and Vanessa um, for their time with us today, as well as our audience uh, for joining us and for those awesome questions. That was that was so great. Um, thank you also to today's partner, the Journalism Education Association. So again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's event, um, as well as some information that some of you have asked for. So we will also post this recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel. And from all of us here with the ProPublica and the Tribune, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. We'll see you next time.